Well, my name is Bill, and I am a man who knows what he wants. I know what it takes to make a good Christian life, and customizing your church-going experience is the way to go. Take this morning, for example. Beautiful Sunday morning. I wake up. I know it's going to be a good day. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Modern conversion, bagels. I love me some bagels. New Horizons has the best bagels in town. I always ask for blueberry because ask and you shall receive. So I get me some blueberry bagels. And then after I eat those bagels, I got to wash it down. So I head over to St. Josephine's to get the coffee. They serve Starbucks. Then the best thing on the list there is the Luke 638 Leche Cappuccino. It's good measure, pressed down, shaken together. It's running over into me. It's good. It's good. I like the greeters at Morningside Baptist. They're the best. They give the best hugs. And so you really can feel the warmth. Then I head over to Open Hearts for worship. Then I head back to Hillside AG for the sermon because the preacher is a good preacher. He gives me lots of things to think about, but doesn't make me feel too guilty when I don't think about it. You know what I mean? You know, no? Well, regardless, right after that, I head over right across the street for communion because they give you an entire dinner roll. Boom. Like not, eh, boom. An entire one. There's no butter for it, but it's okay. It's the body of Christ. Doesn't need butter. From there, I head over to the Crock-Pot Lutheran Church for their weekly potluck. They do it every Sunday. So good. They know how to feed my soul. Sticky buns and chicken casserole. <laughs> so it's all about customizing your church-going experience. Jesus said, God helps those who help themselves. That might have been Ben Franklin, but either way, they're both smart dudes. So how's your spiritual life? What? How's my spiritual life? I guess I'll have to find a church for that. Old Bill struggled with commitment, right? He would visit 18 different churches on Sunday morning just to get the best of each one, but never would lock down and commit to one. And so Bill, just, we, he might be considered a classic church hopper, and, uh, and, and, and obviously that's poking fun at, at visiting churches, but never really connecting. And so this morning, we're going to talk a lot about what it looks like to commit to the local church, to commit. Now, in our culture... The word commit is a four-letter word, isn't it? We have a hard time committing to anything in our culture. And so I get it. This is going to fly in the face of much of what you think about and how you live. But it's going to be good for us, I promise, okay? Now, before we jump into the message today, I first of all wanted to pause and pray because I don't know how many of you knew this, but we actually have a big group of middle and high schoolers down at summer camp right now this week. In fact, I just came back and left them uh, yesterday, and it's been an absolute awesome week. They're down at Ridgecrest Conference Center for Centrifuge there near Asheville, and uh, they're just having a blast. But more importantly, I can tell you because I was there, God has been changing lives in those teenagers' lives. And I'm so excited for them to come back home this afternoon and to share and to live out this faith that they have that's been grown this week. And so I want to take just a moment because actually right now, while we're meeting, they're also in their last session, okay? So let's pray for those teenagers and pray for us right now. Jesus, we love you. God, today we stand in your presence only because of what you've done on the cross, God. Without your death, without your resurrection, we would all be hopeless. And so today, God, we don't stand before you claiming to be righteous. We stand before you knowing that we are only righteous if we are in you. So we celebrate that, God, and we lift you up because of that, God. We celebrate you here this morning. We, we ask you to move. We ask your spirit to teach us through your word. And God, I pray for our teens and our preteens that are, that are down at summer camp right now, God, as they hear your word right now as we speak. I pray that you would, you, you would continue to change lives, that you would continue to draw them to yourself, that you would continue to show them how much you love them, God. 
And God, I pray that they would return home and never be the same again. That they would be full out followers of you, a disciple of you who wants to make disciples. And I pray the same thing over this group today. God, we need you. We need you to show up in a big way this morning. God, I don't know what everyone's facing that's watching online or that's here in person, but God, you know. God, I pray that you step into their darkness. I pray that you step into their struggles, their hurts. God, I pray that you meet them right there with your loving arms, and I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So last week, we kicked off a new series called Weird Things Christians Do. Now, if you're not familiar with, with, with Christianity at all, there are some things that we do in the church that can appear to be a little weird at first glance. For example, what's the deal with Christians drinking these little small juice cups and drinking, eating these little pieces of bread? Like, what's that all about? Or, or maybe you've wondered why we dunk people under the water. Like, why do you do that? Or maybe you wonder why the church talks about membership, because for many of you, the only things you're members of are maybe your Sam's Club or BJ's, and that's because you can get 150 rolls of toilet paper for a discounted price, right? There's reasons that we join these different clubs or, or whatever, right? So why would we consider joining the church? What's that all about? Can't I just attend? So this morning, we're going to explore what it means to be a church member. Here at LifeSpring Church, we call it partnering with LifeSpring Church, and we're going to unpack why that is. But what is it like to be a church member? Now, if you missed last weekend, we explored what communion is or what some traditions call the Lord's Supper. So if you missed that, all of our past sermons are on YouTube and our YouTube channel, which is LifeSpring NC. Just search that. You'll be able to find us, check us out, and you can see any past sermons. But I would highly recommend you check that out. And next week, we're going to talk about baptism. Baptism. Why do we do baptism? Now, before we get started, let's establish this. There's one thing that every single one of us have in common, even though some of you guys I've never met or, or maybe have only said hello to once. Every single one of us, we want to live a life that we would look back on and say that was a fulfilling life, right? We want to live a fulfilling life. That's the desire of every single person that's ever walked the earth. In fact, just a few weeks ago, and y'all might think I'm kind of weird for this, so whatever. But I was walking past the graveyard, right? See all the gravestones. And I know some of you have done the same thing, too. And as you read the names on the gravestones, you, you kind of think in your mind, like at least me, I'm like, I wonder what this person was like. Anybody ever think of that? It's kind of weird, like, but, but they're, they're dead, so we don't know anything about them. I haven't even heard of them. But I wonder what they were like. Like, like. I wonder if this guy was a really great electrician, maybe. Maybe that's what his, his deal was. Maybe he was a family man. He had a big family. Maybe this next person, maybe she was a great preschool teacher that just how, knew how to connect with kids and was great with kids and knew how to teach kids, and, and, and she had an awesome family. Maybe, maybe the next one was a college-age student that... that that they had all these dreams and they were looking to be successful and they had all these ideas of how they can impact the world and, and life ended too soon for them. And you just kind of go down and you, we don't really know, right? But you kind of go down and you're just kind of curious. And I know it may sound a little weird, I get that, but that's just how my brain works. And, and so I wonder a little bit about them. But here's what I know to be true. Every single one of us will be just the same as them one day. And I get it, you're like, I thought this was going to be like a light, happy sermon. Why are we talking about death, all right? But, but, but we have to face reality, right? As, as, as maybe scary it is for some of us, we're going to be a name on a tombstone one day, so to speak. And here's what I know to be true. If we had the opportunity, if we were able to talk to those folks now and hear a little bit about their life, I would guarantee that they, just like us, were seeking to live a fulfilling life. Now, the question is, did they live a fulfilling life? Now, I'm not saying that some of them did not live a fulfilling life, but there are probably many of them that, on the other side of it all, probably look back, you know, don't read too much in this. You guys follow me, okay? But they, they probably wish they would have done things differently so that their lives could be more fulfilling, more edifying, better off for the world, right? And I think that's the position that all of us find ourselves in. We want to live a fulfilling life. And the reason I talk about this, guys, is because, listen, there's going to be a day in which it's going to be too late. <laughs> there's going to be a day when it's all going to end for us. And, and so for now, our goal is, God, what does it look like to live a fulfilling life? Okay? I get it. That's most of our motivations for life. What does it look like to live a fulfilling life? Let me tell you this. What if I told you this morning 
that the only way that you can live a fulfilling life is for you to be a member of a local church. How many of you guys would think I'm kind of crazy? Don't raise your hand. But you would think, all right, this dude has lost his marbles. Like to live a fulfilling life, I have to be a member of a local church. I would argue the answer to that question is yes. And I'm going to unpack it this morning. So if you're ready, look at your neighbor and say, I'm ready. All right, now look at your neighbor and say, I think the pastor's crazy, but I'm going to listen to him anyways. All right, all right, so let's, let's, let's dig in, all right? So we're going to take a look at a passage this morning. This is going to be in Acts chapter 2, okay? If you want to flip along, if you have a Bible with you, you can. I'm going to warn you, we're going to be all over the place in the Bible today, okay? So let me suggest this. If you've never noticed, in the seat in front of you, on the back side of it, there's a little card that says Sermon Notes. I would highly recommend taking it, writing down notes. You can take down any things you hear that are impactful, but also you can write down these scripture references, and you can read them on your own a little later. But we're going to take a look at a passage that I believe is going to show us some very important things about church membership. Because the reason that many of you think that I'm crazy when I say to live a fulfilling life, you have to be a church member. The reason that I think that many of you think that I'm crazy is because of your view of what it means to be a church member, right? Because for most of us, if we're a member of anything, we have an idea of what it means to be a member of something. For example, if you join your local Sam's Club or BJ's, what do you do? You go in there and you fill out you know, a little basic paperwork, you pay them your dues, and guess what? For the next year, you get to enjoy the benefits of being a member of that place. You get to go buy all the toilet paper and soap or whatever you want, but you get to enjoy the benefits of being a member of that club. Or maybe you think of joining uh, a local golf club or a local YMCA, right? What do you have to do? All you have to do is go pay them a little money, sign a piece of paper, fill out a little information, and guess what? You are now a member of that club, and guess what? You can do whatever you want to after that. You can go every day of the week. You can go once a week. You can go once a year. You don't ever have to go. It doesn't matter. Your membership ultimately does not matter to them as long as you're paying your money, right? As long as you're signing that piece of paper, you're paying your money. You do as you please, right? Many of us have a similar view of membership that we have for those places that we do on the local church. We think that we can join the church, sign a piece of paper, maybe shake a sweaty pastor's hand one day and maybe get to the front of the room and he says, welcome, John Doe, this is the mem new member uh, here and his family, blah, blah, blah. But from that moment on, after you've signed the paper and paid your dues or whatever, you don't have to do nothing in your mind. You're just a member of the church. And so I'm just going to live the same way I did beforehand. And really membership, if we're being honest, membership doesn't really mean squat to you. Yeah, you can say you're a member of such and such Baptist church or such and such Presbyterian church, but it really doesn't mean anything in your daily life. So when I say something like, to live a fulfilling life, you have to be a church member, you probably think I'm crazy if this is your view of church membership. But I want to debunk that myth today, and I want us to look at really what church membership really is, okay? So we're looking at Acts chapter 2, and we're going to start with verse 42. Before we start reading, let me give you a little context. This passage here comes just excuse me, just after the resurrection of Jesus. Okay, so Jesus died. He rose again from the dead. This was extremely important, right, for his closest followers. Not only that, but his closest followers, the disciples, they received God's Spirit just prior to this, okay? So they had the Spirit of God living inside of them. And let's read a little bit how they interacted with each other, okay? Starting with verse 42, this is what we read. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of God of all the people. And the Lord, get this, and the Lord added to, the, to their number daily those who were being saved. Those who are being saved. So we can spend an entire series unpacking this passage right here, guys. It is so, so good. But I want to zoom in on one small aspect at the very end. What did it require for someone to join this church? Right at the very end, I believe it says it very clearly. It says, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. 
See it? The gateway into this local church was salvation. John Stott, who's a well-known theologian, he said this about this passage. He said, the Lord did two things together here. He added to their number those who were being saved. He didn't add to them to the church without saving them. He didn't save them without adding them to the church. Salvation and church membership went together, and they still do. To be saved means to be a member of the local church. Those two things go hand in hand, and you can't separate the two. To be saved means that I'm now a part of a family, a family of believers, a family who's united in Christ together. So you guys can write this down. This is our first major point of today. Church membership does not save, but it must follow salvation. Church membership does not save, but it must, must follow salvation. So a mission into this family, the family of God, is as simple as being saved. This has nothing to do with signing a piece of paper, right? Even though I'm going to talk about, yes, there is a piece of paper in your seat, which is a little ironic, but we're going to talk about this in a moment. Being a part of the family of God, first of all, starts with being saved. And you may be thinking, now, now what does this have to do with being fulfilled? Like, I thought that's how we started. Well, get this. To live a fulfilled life, the first step of that is being saved. Being saved. Now, why is that the case? Because for some of you, especially if you're new, you're thinking, saved? Saved from what? So here's a story of the Bible. This is a story of the reality that we live in. Whether or not you've accepted it yet or not, this is the story we live in. God made every single one of us unique in his own image, which is really cool, by the way. He made us in his image, but every single one of us, from the day we breathed our first breath on this life, in this life, we were sinners. We were born into sin, but then as we got older, we chose to sin. Now, what is sin? Sin is missing the mark of God's perfection. It's rebelling from God's wishes, rebelling from God's commands, disobeying God. You fill in the blank. If it goes against God, it is sin. So not only are we born into sin, we also sin against God. Now, the problem with that, guys, is listen, we all inside of us, we want to live fulfilling lives. Well, guess what? You can't when you're in your sin because God has wired you otherwise. You're going against his good design. You pull a fish from water, what will happen? He will suffer and he will die. Every single one of us are living apart from God's good design. We are sinners. We sin against God. That's not how we were supposed to be. We were supposed to have great, perfect, pure relationship with God. But because we have sinned, a relationship with God is impossible. In fact, I've heard it said before, sin is like a gulf between us and God that we can't get across. There's nothing that you can do to repair the mess that you have made. Sin prevents us from knowing God. And even so, not only does it prevent us from knowing God, but guess what? Because of sin, we stand at odds against, against God. And therefore, God must punish the sin in our life. And I don't know what that will look like exactly, but to face the punishment and wrath of God is a scary thing, guys. And God says that your sin and my sin deserves his punishment. But guess what? While we have sinned against God and while our entire lives have been bent against him, guess what? He has never quit loving us. Because he loves us so much, he devised a rescue plan to rescue you out of the darkness that you live in. He devised a plan through his own son by sending him to earth to become a man, both fully God and fully man, living a sinless life, never sinned, not once, so that one day, one day, he could take your place. He could take my place and face the punishment of God for us. That's what this Sticker here says, Jesus in my place. That's what it means that Jesus died in my place. When he hung on the cross, guess what? That was your cross. That was my cross. But Jesus took the punishment that I deserve, showing us the greatest love that we could ever experience. He came to rescue us out of our darkness when he should have just left us on our own and allow us to live a miserable life and then eventually face his wrath. God chose to come to rescue us. And he tells us, listen, he died. Three days later, he rose again from the dead. Because he's alive, he has defeated our worst enemy. That is sin and death. 
And because he is alive, if we say yes to him and believe upon his work on the cross and his resurrection through faith alone, then we can be saved. We can be saved. Do you see why it's a big deal? Like, like there's nothing else more important than are you saved? Are you a child of God? So if you have never really believed that, if you have never put your full trust in that and committed to following him, that's step one to living a fulfilling life is to be saved. And Jesus says here in this passage that as these people were saved, guess what? They were part of the family of God. Let's take a look at what this family of God looks like. This is from 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12. It says this, Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body. So it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body. Whether Jews or Gentiles, it don't matter your race. Whether slave or free, it doesn't matter your background. We were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. You see, what we see here in this passage is the church being described as a body, right? And this body, it says, is unified around a few things. First of all, it says they are unified in salvation demonstrated by baptism. Baptism. Now, we're going to take time to really unpack that next week. But what you need to know is baptism is to show off what God has done in your own heart. It's an outward display to show the world and the church what God has done in your heart, that he has saved you. In the Bible, you don't have salvation apart from baptism. Those two things go hand in hand. And in the same way, salvation led to baptism. Baptism led to church membership. When you're saved, you also are part of the local church. But get this, this church here, it says, are made up of many parts, but yet they form one body. Now, what unites them? They're united in, in salvation, demonstrated through baptism, but also it says that they are united because they all have the Holy Spirit. There's one Spirit here. Don't get caught up in the wording here. There's one Spirit. You see, the promise of the gospel is not only you can be saved from your sins, but that God himself will come and live inside of you once he rescues you. This is why we call it a relationship. Because God, the God who made everything, the God who sustains everything, comes and lives inside of you when you say yes to him. Guys, nothing else matters. Your background doesn't matter. What you did last night doesn't matter. Your ethnicity doesn't matter. Your income doesn't matter. What matters is whether or not you have received Jesus, whether or not you have been saved. And he'll save any one of us, no matter where you are, no matter what you've done. That's the God that we serve. So this body is supposed to work together, all different parts, right? The body has an arm. It has, has two arms, hopefully. It has legs, feet, toes. It has all these different body parts. But God says that all of those body parts are to work together to accomplish the mission that Jesus has given us. And get this. One arm, apart from the body, doesn't do the body any good, does it? A leg... I actually tried to get a mannequin for this sermon, by the way, full disclosure. I tried to get a mannequin. I was going to take them apart. But did you know that mannequins cost a lot of money? <laughs> they told me that. They were like, we don't lend out mannequins because they cost so much money. And I'm like, what? It's just a body. But anyways, so I'm going to have to use my own leg, so forgive me. So what is a random leg doing by itself? It can't do anything, right? So God gives this picture here. The only way the leg or the arm or the hand or anything else is of any use is as if it's a part of the body it's meant to be a part of. You guys follow? The church is like a body. And guess what? Just as you being an arm by yourself is not doing anybody any good, guess what? The rest of the body is relying on that arm. So you're valuable to the local church. You're an arm, you're a leg, you're a foot, you're a mouth, right? Some of you have very big mouths, but that's okay because you make up the body. You make up the body. So you can't separate salvation from church membership. In fact, you guys can write this down. This is our big statement of the day. Just as salvation demonstrated through baptism is your commitment to Christ, so church membership is your commitment to Christ's family. Just as salvation demonstrated through baptism is your commitment to Christ, so church membership is your commitment to Christ's family. So Mark, how does this help me live a fulfilled life? I need you to bring it back around here because it's how you started and what does this have to do with me living a fulfilled life? Because listen, 
unless you are part of this body that God has made you to be a part of, you will always let be left feel, feel sorry, can't get words out. You will always be left feeling unfulfilled because you're just a stray arm running around or a stray leg. But when you're plugged into the body, God is going to do something awesome in your life. So God is screaming at us, never consider doing it alone. Following Jesus, yes, it's a personal decision, but it's never just personal. Amen. It's a family you step into when you say yes to Jesus. Look at how this body benefits us. Look at Ephesians 4, 16. It says this, From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. You know how you grow as a Christian? It comes through the body. Amen. It comes through the body. God uses the body to help you grow. Guess what? You need people speaking truth in your life. You need people loving you, pointing you to Jesus, encouraging you, kicking your rear in once in a while. We all need that, right? We need that in our lives. So in order for your life to flourish, guess what? You have to be a part of the body. And in order for the church to flourish, guess what? You have to be a part of the body because the church relies on you. And I'm talking about the local church here. Like, how many of you know there's, there's the global church? Like, there's Christians all around the world, most of which we'll never meet, right? That's what you might call the global church. However, the majority of the time in the New Testament, which is the part of the Bible written about Jesus, after Jesus, and, and, and kind of reflecting on Jesus' life and his death and resurrection, that whole portion, when it speaks about the church, most every single time it's talking about a local church. It's a letter written to a local church. It's, it's Paul addressing a local church that he helped start. It's talking about joining a local church and being baptized into a local church. So we have this picture that the church is a body. And so the question that comes up is, well, is it possible, is it possible to be a Christian and to not be a part of a local church? You see, it wasn't too long ago, just recently actually, I was, I was speaking to someone and they were sharing with me about their faith story and I was, I was rejoicing with them and just hearing a little bit about what God's been doing in their family's life and it was really cool guys and I was celebrating with them and I asked them though as a follow-up question, I said, well, what, what local church are you guys a part of? Because there's some really good local churches around, around Johnson County. So I asked, because I knew they weren't here and I asked them and, and she said that, you know, we're not a part of a local church. My family, we just kind of do our own thing, Right? And we, we, we do ministry, like we just, we just kind of do our own thing. And, and when I heard that, my heart broke because a question came in my mind, and it's this, and I want you guys to reflect on it because there's some of you that are likely in here today or online today that this is your sentiment. Yes, I, I want to have a relationship with Jesus. I consider myself a Christian, but I'm not a big fan of local church. Well, let me ask you guys a question, and I want you to consider it. Is it possible for a genuine Christian to reject the very thing that Christ loves? Is it possible? Christ died for his church. I know oftentimes we put our name in there, which is true also, but Christ didn't just die for you. He died for his bride. You see, the picture that's painted in the New Testament, guys, is that Jesus is the groom and the church is the bride. He loves his bride. He died for his bride. His mission is going to be accomplished by his bride, which is the church. So for us to think that I can follow Jesus, but yet I don't like the church and I'm not going to be a part of a church, makes no sense. In fact, I'll say this. If that is your view of Christianity, then I believe you've got a mistaken view of Christianity. And I can tell you this confidently, that you're walking out of the will of God. And it's probably the reason that you're not living a fulfilling life. Because this is God's plan and you're doing your own thing. And it sounds good, sure. You can make a convincing argument that you don't have to belong to a church. But when you read the Bible, which is our ultimate source of truth, this is not what we see. So if we're going to love God, you have to love the church. And Jesus tells us that every baptized believer should be a part of a local church. And now I get it. I know when you read this, you're thinking, well, Mark, things were different then. Like, these were newly converted people. These were newly baptized people, and, and there was only a few churches, so it was easy for them just to be a part of church. Now there's a church on every corner, right? There's 18 different denominations in my town, and there's 40 different churches, right? And so, so it's a little more challenging. It's not as black and white. Well, yes and no. <laughs> 
the command of Jesus doesn't change despite the fact that we've got 40 churches on every corner in our city, right? The command of Jesus is that if you are saved, then you are a part of a local church. Doesn't change, right? So you have to discover and learn how am I to navigate what Jesus commands me to, to do in light of the culture I live in. So how does this apply? How does this apply? It means that every single one of us should be asking, what church am I going to be officially a member of, a part of, a, a, a committed part of, right? And, and, and there's no such thing really in the New Testament of someone who just attends a church. There really isn't. I know I'm stepping on some feet here, and some of you are probably going to stake me to a wall after this, but there really is no such thing as someone who just attends church services, but who's not a part of a local church who's not a member, who's not plugged in, who's not serving, who's not loving, who's not connecting with a local church. There's no such thing. Now I get it in our culture, you, you kind of have to fill things out a little bit. I get it. Like you, you, you probably don't want to join a church just after visiting them one time or whatever. But listen, after a few weeks, at the most, after a few months, you should know. God's not going to delay confirming that in your heart. If there's a delay after a few months, guess what? That's on you. It ain't God. There is... So many ways that you can explore a church into our society. Like every one of our sermons is online. Everything we believe about God is online. If you want to know more about our church, guess what? We have people who will be more than glad to have coffee with you, lunch with you, answer any questions you may have. And guess what? There is no reason why you shouldn't commit or either say, this isn't for me. Straddling the fence is never a good posture for any Christian. Amen. It's not. And I get it, half of y'all might not be here next week after this, but that's okay, because guess what? I want you to know the truth of God, and the truth of God is either commit or commit somewhere else, but don't keep one foot in and one foot out. There's no such thing in God's economy. So if we can help with that, let us know. Let us know, because I'd be more than glad to, to, to either say, hey, you should plug in here at LifeSpring, join LifeSpring, or I can direct you to another church, because guess what? There are some awesome churches around, and this isn't a competition we're building the kingdom of God together. It don't matter what labels on the name. We are working together. In fact, many of you may not know this, but we're a part of like three different uh, groups of churches that are all working together locally and across the state, across the nation, across the world even, to plant churches, to, to support each other. We're working together because this thing isn't a competition. So if life's bringing you feel like this isn't my flavor of ice cream, guess what? I can recommend you at least three other flavors down the road that you might like a little better, right? If that's even a word. I don't even know if that's good either. But listen, I'm, what I'm saying is I'm not, this isn't a sales pitch for Life Spring Church. This is a sales pitch for the Word of God to show you what the Word of God says and to challenge you to commit somewhere. And listen, the moment you walk out of these doors, guess what? You're leaving the greatest set of leaders and pastors that you will ever find in Johnson County. I mean, I'm serious. Look, look, look at what you have here. You have the Gerber baby's face right here pa pastoring you today, okay? We have Dylan. Sure, his hairline's running away from his nose, but he's a great guy too. And sure, David likes to talk a bit much, but he's still awesome, right? So, so, so you have the greatest. I'm just messing with you guys. Obviously, I love the guys we serve with here, and I think that God has, has put together an awesome team here at LifeSpring. But there are some other great churches around, so don't hear this as a sales pitch for LifeSpring Church. Hear this as a command of God that your job as a Christian is to be a part of a local church because you matter and you're valuable. But listen, while we're talking about church membership, I do want to talk for a few minutes about what it means to be a member of Life Spring Church. In fact, up until this moment, I've used the word member primarily because of familiarity. But here at Life Spring, we actually use the term partnership. And the reason we do that is because the connotation that this word membership carries with it. Most of you, when you think of being a member of something, you think, I have rights, right? I pay my money, I have rights. But partnership, I believe, conveys a little bit more accurately what it means to be a part of a local church. It means that it's not about rights. It's about how can I be a part of this movement and how can I partner in what God is doing through Life Spring Church in this community. And so I believe this word partnership is a better word. And so what I want to talk about is I want to talk about four commitments that you'll make if you partner with LifeSpring Church. Four commitments. So we're going to walk through each one. So here's the four commitments real quick, and then we're going to unpack each one. First of all, when we commit to LifeSpring Church, we are committing in how we relate to other partners at the church. We're making a commitment to other partners at LifeSpring Church. Number two, we're also making a commitment in how we relate to God. 
We're making a commitment on how we relate to God. Number three, we also are making a commitment in how we relate to the leaders of LifeSpring Church. Okay, so we're going to unpack that. Number four, we are also making a commitment into how we interact and how we love those outside of LifeSpring Church. So there's four commitments that we are asking for people that partner with LifeSpring Church to make. So let's read a passage of Scripture that I believe is a beautiful picture of what it looks like to be the local church. This is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I'm going to read about 10 verses, so you guys just read along with me. Start with verse 14, we see this. And we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive. Encourage the disheartened, help the weak, be patient with everyone. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all and hold on to what is good. Reject every kind of evil. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. We are all a work in progress it's so what this, pack, this, this uh, scripture pictures. We are all a work in process, and every one of us has a role to play in helping God's church become the church he wants it to be. So what do these commitments look like? Let's first of all ex- explore the commitment that each of us make to other partners in Life Spring Church when we become a partner in Life Spring Church. The first and biggest commitment that we make is to gather together. There is no such thing as being a part of a local church without gathering with that church. Now, I'm not saying you have to attend X amount of Sundays per year to officially be considered uh, like you're gathering or whatever. It's not super black and white like that. It's a principle that you gather with the local church. Sure, you might miss a Sunday here and there. You might miss this and that and the other. But the principle is that I am committing to gathering with the local church because guess what? Unless we gather together regularly, you're not really a part of the church. Your name might be on a list, whatever, but unless you gather together regularly, you're not really a part of that church. Now, especially after we come out of what we just came out of with the pandemic, gathering together is more important now than it's ever been before. We need to gather together, right? Now, there's lots of ways you can do that, and we're never going to put limits on that. If you want to gather daily, that's awesome, right? Minimally, though, as a church, we're going to gather on the weekends together. Every weekend, we're going to gather together. But there is no limits to that. So gather together. And when you gather together, here are some commitments that we're making to each other. We're going to love each other. We're going to pray for each other. We're going to serve each other. We're going to rejoice and give thanks with one another, right? We're going to be patient with one another. We're going to pursue peace and unity with one another. This is what we're going to do when we gather. And last but not least, we're going to hold each other accountable. And I know that's a four-letter word in the church. Because no one wants to be held accountable, but we need to hold each other accountable. We need someone saying, hey man, I haven't seen you lately. Yeah, I haven't seen you lately. Are you still, you know, what's going on? Everything good? Right? You know, how's your time in the Word of God been lately? How's your prayer life been lately? How's your family doing? We need people keeping us accountable. This is the commitment we make when we commit to being with each other. We commit to gather together. The second commitment we make when we partner with Life Spring Church is we make a commitment to God. And the commitment towards God can be summarized by saying this. It means that we are committing to abiding in Jesus and becoming like Jesus. That I am committing to abiding in Jesus and becoming like Jesus. How do we do that? Lots of ways. Let me give you a few examples. We commit to reading God's Word regularly. To read God's Word regularly. That's how God speaks to us primarily is through His Word. We commit to praying regularly for the church, for the community. We commit to praying. Number three, we commit to living our entire lives as worship to God. In other words, I'm not just a Sunday morning Christian. I'm a a seven-day-a-week Christian. Every moment of every day, I want to live to worship God. We're committing to giving to God of our time, of our talent, of our treasure. We're making that commitment to God. It's all yours. It's not mine. If you've talented me in something, if you've given me something, guess what? You gave it to me. It's all yours. I give it back to you. That's the commitment we're making. And last but not least, we're committing to love God above all else. Nothing else in the place of God. This is the commitment we make to God when we partner with the local church. Number three, what does it look like to make a commitment to the local leaders of the local church? Okay? Now, some of you are like, why have we got to do that? Like, that's getting kind of weird right here, right? Because in our society, we don't really love the the concept of authority. We don't. 
We all want to be our own authority. We want to call our own shots. We don't like that. But get this. When we say yes to God, guess what we're also doing? We're saying, yes, I submit to your authority, God. So the first thing we need to know in a relationship with Jesus, guess what? He's the authority. I'm not. But also within the local church, God has appointed elders and pastors to oversee that church and to have authority over that church. And so what it means to commit to a local church is saying, I, res- I will respect and love the elders and pastors of that church. And that doesn't just apply to elders and pastors. It applies to everybody in leadership of that church because guess what? God is the one working through that church and God has appointed leaders to lead you at that church, whether it's team leaders or group leaders or whatever it may be. But it means when, it, when, when I say to partner with a local church, it also means that I'm going to respect the people in leadership at that church. And so what does that look like? First Thessalonians 5, this is going back a couple verses to verse 12, says this. Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you and care for you in the Lord and who admonish you, speaking here of the elders of this local church. Hold them in the highest regard and love because of their work. Live in peace with one another. So when you make a commitment to be a partner at Life Spring Church, you're also committing to these things. And that would include this. First of all, acknowledge and honor your leaders. Like in, in a culture where we want to backbite and talk badly about, like acknowledge and honor your leaders. Secondly, pray for your leaders. Pray for the pastors and pray for their families. They have stepped into the bullseye of Satan whenever they step into a leadership role at Life Spring Church. So pray for them. Pray for their families. Bring your pastors Krispy Kreme donuts and gift cards to a local steakhouse. Anytime, that's that's actually not in the Bible, but it's not a bad practice, all right? (laughs) Follow your leaders joyfully, right? It's, It's easy to always buck against people. Some of us, that's our nature. But be willing to be a good follower. And I get it. Sometimes if you get caught in a bad situation in a church that's not teaching the Bible, there are times that you may need to buck back a little bit or maybe confront the pastor, but there's a place and time and a way to discuss that. It's not by smearing them on Facebook. It's not by putting dirty mail out there. Guys, listen, honor your pastors. Number five, even when there is some slight disagreement, let's agree to be in unity with our pastors. Let's agree to be in unity. Sure, we might disagree on some little minor things, right? But that's a part of being unified together. We can disagree on the little things, but agree on the big things and be unified in that. Last but not least, when we make a commitment to be a partner at Life Spring Church, we are committing to also those outside of the local church. Look at Matthew 28. This is considered the great commission, one of the great or one of the last commands that Jesus gave his followers, and this goes for us too. Many of you familiar with this. We'll read it together. Verse 18 says, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. As a partner of Life Spring Church, We want to give every single person who is not saved an opportunity to hear about Jesus and to become a disciple who makes disciples, right? We want to give every person an opportunity to step in that. So here's the commitment that we're making towards those outside of the church. First of all, we're committing that we are going to be missionaries both at home and beyond. Now, you may not think of yourself as a missionary, but guess what? If you are saved, you are a missionary. You are one on the mission of Jesus, Okay, so we're committing to be a missionary to those who are not yet a part of the family. Number two, we're committing to sharing the gospel of Jesus with anybody we can. Number three, we're committing to inviting folks to be a part of the family here at Lifespring, whether it's by inviting them to a Sunday morning or inviting them to something else. We're committing to inviting people. Number four, we are committing to figuring out ways to reach the lost people around us, whether they're at our workplace and our family and our community. We're committed to helping reach them. Number five, we're praying for those around you who do not know Jesus. We're praying for our community, right? Unless we're praying, then guess what? There's likely not going to be much movement. We're committed to serving them, both 
personally and also corporately, right? Looking for ways for you to serve the people in your neighborhood. Looking for ways to join together as a church to serve. For instance, we have a partnership with South Smithfield Elementary School that we send volunteers and we love them and, and we want to bless that school. And so to commit to being a part of Life Spring Church means to also commit to corporately working together to bless this school. And last but not least, when we commit to being a partner of Life Spring Church, we're committing to working together to take this good news to the nations and not just locally. Sure, God has you right here in this season, but we can pray, we can give, we can go to the nations because guess what? The whole world needs to hear the good news of Jesus. See, the family of God is a family that multiplies. That's who we are as a church, a family that multiplies. So I get it. We've talked about a lot of stuff today, and you're probably still thinking, like, what does this have to do with being fulfilled? Well, I hope that you've seen what we've covered so far, that first of all, fulfillment starts with being saved. But number two, fulfillment comes as we join the body, Christ's bride, the local church. Because if we are living in Christ, if we are saved by him, and we walk away or do not walk with the local church, then guess what? We are out of his will. And there is no way that anybody will ever live a fulfilling life apart from God's will. You won't. You won't. So here's what I'm challenging each of you to do. I'm challenging each of you to consider where are you at in the journey. If you're new and you're like, I'm not joining this church today. It's my first time here, and I'm not so sure uh, that you aren't a whackhead or whatever. I don't, I don't know what position you're in, but I get it. You might not be ready to join the church today, and that's fine. But if you have been a part of Life Spring Church for a little while, maybe you've been attending, uh, maybe for a few weeks, a few months, maybe for a couple, some of you a few years, and today's the first time you've really seen a clear picture of what it means to be a member or a partner of Life Spring Church, then I want to challenge you, don't sit on the sidelines anymore. Commit and become a part of this body. But for those of you also who are already partners at Life Spring Church, in fact, everybody can take a look at the papers in your seat. For those of you who are already partners at Life Spring Church, which is a lot of you, Take a look back at what you agreed to. Use this as a reminder to the commitment that you made to each other, to God, to the outside world, and to the pastors of this church. But if you're not yet a partner here at Life Spring Church, I want to invite you to take that step of faith and to commit. Because we would love nothing more for you to step in to this body and become all who God wants you to be. Because maybe you're the arm that we're missing. Or maybe you're the leg that we're missing, right? And God wants you to be a functioning part of his body. So during the last song and during our, our, our kind of our closing uh, portion of today, take time and, and fill that out if you want to take that step. Or if you have questions, maybe you've got some specific questions. Listen, I'll be up here afterwards, find one of the other pastors around. We'd love to answer any questions you have. But listen, do not hear or do not miss the main thrust of today. Church membership is what God wants for every one of you. So if you have given your life to Jesus, then do not delay. And if this isn't the place, that's okay, guys. But do not delay because he wants you to be a plugged-in part of his body. That's when you will thrive, and that's when his church will flourish. And there's nothing stopping God moving through his church when we're all united. I'm excited to see what the future holds for us, church. Can we pray together?